Oh, hey, biology. Hope you're doing well when you watch this video. Um, today, we're going to be talking about the last two like lessons in chapter 18, Evolution of Populations. And so we're going to be talking about speciation today and also kind of molecular evolution, Hox genes a little bit, molecular clocks, and if they're valid or not. And so anyways, I hope you find yourselves well and your families well when you watch this. Um, if you have any questions, please reach out to me. I'm probably going to take the webcam away for the most of this video because there's like a lot of pictures and stuff. And so I'm not going to like change from like popping up to disappearing to popping up to disappearing. So just wanted to say, hey. All right, so let's get started here. Um, so where do new species come from? So that's the, the goal of the first part of this video. And so we want to try to identify the types of isolation you know, different types of isolation that can lead to the formation of new species. And also, I want to, you to kind of understand the, the general hypothesis about how those, you know, famous finches that Darwin saw, all the different ones, how did they come to exist? Um, and there's some cool examples with that. So first off, the formation of new species, usually by the division of a single species into two or more genetically distinct ones. Okay, so that's called speciation. Speciation is the formation of new you can't draw and need a writing pad. New species, right? And so that's what we're trying to talk about right now. We're trying to talk about species, right? Species are organisms that can mate together and also produce fertile offspring, okay? So we've already discussed species. So again, um, from a biblical perspective, species and created kind are not synonymous. God created according to kind in Genesis 1. And so there's a lot of maybe change within a kind, but biggest one of the biggest issues Christians have with evolution, most Christians, is that um, evolution says that we all came from the same single organism and that uh, humans and chimpanzees and other, um, you know, type of primates share a common ancestor. And we believe that Adam was created from the dust of the ground. So that's, that is, a, you know, an issue. Um, there's, you know, we're finding new species every single year. So there's millions and millions of species on the planet. Um, and this biodiversity that we see um, is, you know, that's because God orchestrated it that way. He created all the diversity within the original DNA that he set up. And DNA, we're going to see, is very powerful. and can, So small changes can lead to drastic developmental changes. So there's three types of isolating mechanisms that we need to know. There's geographic, behavioral, and temporal, okay? These are different isolating mechanisms that can lead to the formation of new species. So, for example... Um, here's just, sorry, just a definition real quick, species, right? Speciation, just some definitions right there. But here's, here's like some of the major ones. Behavioral isolation. So first off, different songs, some, you know, different songs, species different in their mating rituals. Mechanical isolation, which is structural differences, prevent species from mating. Uh, prevention, uh, this is a reproductive isolating mechanism, by the way. Prevention of gamete fusion. So gametes of one species function uh, species function poorly with the gametes of another species, so therefore the, there's no acceptance of the sperm sometimes. And then post-zygotic, which means post-development hybrid uh, infertility. That's like your mule or your zonkey or, you know, stuff like that, which they, some of the science has debated a little bit, but nonetheless, you know, so let's say a fertilization can occur, but the hybrids do not develop properly and they're usually infertile, which, which means they cannot um, pass on their genes. Okay. So that is just some examples of more, you know, maybe detailed isolated mechanisms. So in your book, they talk about behavioral. So first off mating rituals, like the different species of bird, you know, uh, birds, they sing different songs when trying to attract a mate. Geographic isolation is they're physically separated, physically separated by barriers like rivers, mountains, huge bodies of water. I want to talk to you a little bit about an example here. Here's an example of geographic isolation. You have the kaibab squirrel and the Abert's squirrel, and they're literally different species. You, man, crazy ears on that one, like legit. But north rim and south rim. And so this is an example of geographic a barrier. Um, the Grand Canyon squirrels. You know, I love, oh gosh, I want to see the Grand Canyon so bad. But they became geographically isolated from the common ancestor, but its closest relative, the Abert squirrel. Since then, several distinguishing features, black belly, forelimbs, have gradually evolved. And you can see the differences between the two. And, um, and again, would Christians have an issue with this? And the answer is no. You know, we have two squirrels here. Um, it's not, you know, and they came from a common ancestor. You know, 
that's not that's not a problem when we start talking about macro evolution and you know single cell to you that's when christians just throw up a warning flag um temporal isolation is they reproduce at different times so you can see all of this is kind of relating to mating um reproduce at different times so one form of cicada emerges every 17 years the other emerges every 13 years so of course you're missing that by four years you're not going to be mating together uh examples in frogs bullfrogs um, one mates in April, the other mates in July. So this would be temporal. Okay, let's move on to the Galapagos finches. So how might the founder effect of natural selection produce reproductive isolation? So it's all about reproductive isolation. And so according to this hypothesis, speciation in Galapagos finches occurred by the founding. So how did it occur? How did all these different finches exist, come to exist? Perhaps by founding a new population, geographic isolation, changes in the gene pool, behavioral isolation and ecological competition okay and there's i uh, showed you i had you watch a video for homework about this from um, bum but you can see again that the uh the finches have different kind of tools as beaks and those beaks allow them to survive because those beaks allow them to select certain types of either food berries insects different types of things and they compete based upon their beaks and sometimes during certain situations some beaks outcompete the others. Some birds with a certain beak species outcompete the others. So the Grants, famous research scientist, realized that Darwin's hypothesis rests on two testable assumptions. Remember, science is all about testing. We don't assume, we check. So for beak size and shape to evolve, there must be enough heritable variation, again, that the power of DNA in those traits to provide raw material for natural selection. So differences in beak size and shape must produce differences in fitness. And so they've seen, they saw that there's a bell curve with this. Anatomical characteristics appealed, appeared in a bell shape. So some had small beaks, some of them had medium, you know, and then, you know, there was a, uh, you know, bell curve, most, most of them weren't at the extremes. And these data indicate that there's great variation, again, power of DNA, of heritable traits among the finches that Darwin saw. And so natural selection, so the grand stat showed individual finches with different sized beaks had different chances of surviving drought. So here's the environment driving selection. When food was scarce, individuals with the largest beaks were more likely to survive. So this was directional um, selection. A larger beak size was selected. And so this is very important to understand. Nature selected based upon competition and struggled for survival. Um, competition and climate change, we've talked a lot about climate change this year, drive natural selection. So let's go through kind of what your book shows. First off, many years ago, a few finches from South America, let's say species M, arrived on the Galapagos Islands. Okay, founder effect, the allele frequency, frequency was completely different possi prob probably than the South American population. Remember the founder effect, genetic drift. After many years, um, because of the founder effect, you know, then species, you know, A moved to A. So let's say that one species of finch, you know, maybe through mutation or something developed in the species A, uh, changed over time, and then it flew to a different island. And then this could have caused, and this text is wrong, I'm sorry about that. But you can see from the picture here that this one finch bird flew to the other, and this is geographic isolation now. So over time, this geographic isolation would have driven these species to develop differently, different habits, maybe different behavioral rituals. And so natural selection could have caused two distinct populations to occur, A and B now, because there's different environments, possibly different rituals developing over time. Now, over time, of course, you know, things are going to happen probably, and, and the birds will migrate back and forth. And so once A and B came back into contact with one another, they no longer can mate together and produce viable offspring. So speciation possibly could have occurred. Birds that are most different from each other have the highest fitness level. That's what they've seen. So of course, if you're similar to each other, you compete. But if you're a lot, if you're very different, you have different niches in the environment and therefore you can survive at a higher rate. And so three, these processes of geographic isolation, genetic drift, or change, and behavioral isolation could have repeated again and again and seeing that we have around 13 different finch species found there today. Pretty crazy stuff. The last section in chapter 18 deals with molecular evolution. So I'm just going to briefly talk to you about how new genes, where do they come from? Hox genes are super powerful, crazy cool. We're not going to learn too much about them in ninth grade biology, but you'll learn a lot more about them down the road 
in biology, biological sciences, and then if you continue on that path. And then finally, explain how molecular clocks work. So we have roughly 25,000 genes in our human body. Some people estimate more, some people estimate less. But where did they come from? Well, science has, has some, you know, theories. First off, gene duplication. So you have your original gene, and possibly that gene could duplicate, okay? And the mutation in one copy could maybe give a new function. And the original gene keeps the same original function. So therefore, you have possibly a, a protein. Now you have two different forms of the protein doing two different things. Also, genetic rearrangement. You know, whether that's by chromosomal uh, crossing over or mutations or sexual recombination. Uh, for a little extra credit on the test, if you want to answer these questions right here for me, that'd be cool. I uh, want to see who's actually watching this video or not. Good stuff. All right, so multiple copies of duplicated gene can turn to a group. So you have an example of this in your body, and it's, hem it's called the globins, hemoglobins. They carry oxygen in your blood. The globin gene family that produces them evolved after gene duplication from a single ancestral globin gene. You can look more of this up, but that's just one example of possibly a gene that duplicated that allowed it, um, it to develop. The duplication allowed the gene to have multiple different, um, you know, I guess, alpha units and beta units. And all those different units have different, I'm going to turn my phone down because it keeps beeping, um, different functions. So this is an example of gene duplication. So here's a picture here. You have the alpha and the beta globin gene function. You can see that they're, the genes are different. One's on chromosome 16, one's on chromosome 11 in your body. So this could be a duplication event. Another uh, example of how maybe new genes come about is Evo Devo because it says it's between evolution and embryological development. Embryological development, again, is when you are inside developing inside your mother. And so Darwin himself had a hunch that changes in the growth of embryos could transform adult body size and shape. What's great about this is that the fruit fly is an example of a model. We know the entire genome of the fruit fly. It's been studied in many, many different research uh, articles and, and experiments. And so homeotic genes or Hox genes, very powerful developing developmental genes. And so this is an illustration of a Hox gene. So Hox genes change the development. Um, the illustration, the legs of the fruit fly and the legs of the brine shrimp are the same color because of a variant of the same gene. So fruit flies have lost a lot of their legs from their common ancestor, possibly. Where did all those legs go? Well, it was a mutation that changed the development of the legs. This is from a website here that I encourage you to go to. This website, uh, you know, you can see right here, but this is how powerful Hox genes are. Scientists realize that sometimes where feet were in place of mouth parts and and there was balanced organs instead of wings. Some even had legs grown out of their head in place of antennae. Scientists call these modifications homeotic transformations because one body part seemed to have been replaced by another. Researchers discovered that many of these transformations were caused by defects. Again, it's all DNA, guys. All changes in DNA. Defects in single genes, which they turned homeotic or Hox genes. And so you can see how powerful Hox genes are. So small changes in Hox genes can lead to extreme differences in developmental um, problems. And so if I asked you, uh, well, that kind of went across the screen. Let's just skip forward since that went across the screen. I don't know how to change that. <laughs> Let's just go here. Molecular evolution. The last thing that your book talks about, it's not 17.4, it's 18.4. Uh, molecular evolution is basically how can we know when species evolve genetically? And they've, they've come up with something called molecular clocks. And so what they do is they basically look at mutations between different species and, and similar protein gene, you know, genes. And the more mutations there are, the longer that species, um, the longer ago that species shared a common ancestor. And so let me show you an example here. So for example, um, C is more closely related to B because C and B have more DNA similar than C and A. Okay, so they share a more close related common ancestor. That's what is... Is talking about there. So mutations can either have a negative or positive effect, but most of them we've already talked about is negative, and most of them, uh, you know, have no effect at all or they're null. They have a null effect. And so this is an example of molecular clocks. And so the molecular clock hypothesis, I just want you to know, like, this isn't foolproof science. Um, it was originally proposed by these scientific you know, scientists. Um, Chimera suggested that a large fraction of new mutations did not have an effect on evolutionary fitness. So naturally selection would neither favor or, you know, a large fraction, like all these mutations don't really matter. Eventually, each of these neutral mutations would be spread throughout a population or become fixed 
or they would be entirely lost. Chimera then showed that the rate at which neutral mutations become fixed is equivalent to the rate of appearance of new mutations. So this is all about timing. We're trying to understand how long ago species diverge and develop into different species and how long ago they evolve. This is called molecular, you know, like, much like your clock helps you do time. This is molecular clocks. But here's the issue, right? Here's the issue. The assumptions, there's always, you know, there's an assumption here, is too simplistic because here we go. How do we know the rates have been the same throughout all that time? Molecular evolution can vary significantly among organisms. How do we know that mutations arrive at the same rate in different organisms? And the answer is we don't. So, it, you know, it's something nice to know about if you have a question on it. On a, on a test or anything, but it's not exactly foolproof science. So a molecular clock uses the average rate at which a given gene or protein accumulates changes to gauge the time of divergence or when species develop in a species. So last thing you can do for a little extra credit on the test, this is a rainbow trout, and this is a brown trout. So this is from the website right here. They're found in similar waters across the United States. I want you to explain to me how would you determine uh, you know, how different these species are at, from an evolutionary perspective. How long ago did they evolve? What would you do to figure out where, how these species are related evolutionarily? Okay, so just kind of write it down a few of your responses. We'll talk about a few things, of course, over these videos that we've talk, discussed to kind of give you some hints about how you could attack that problem. But that was just for a little bit more extra credit on the test. So anyways, I hope this was helpful. I hope you all are doing well. I'll talk to you later.